South Sudan became independent 10 years ago, but jubilation quickly gave way to war, famine, and political infighting. So what's the future for the world's youngest nation? Can there be peace? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. South Sudan's first president, Salva Kiir, promised a new beginning of tolerance, love, and unity 10 years ago. The world's newest nation had gained independence after decades of war with the rest of Sudan. But the excitement was soon replaced by a civil war of its own, fragile peace deals, and humanitarian crises. Salva Kiir still leads the nation a decade on, but he's been locked in a power struggle with the first vice president, Riek Machar. Many say their rivalry has hindered South Sudan's development, particularly relating to the country's vast oil reserves. Speaking at a ceremony to mark independence, here urged people to embrace peace. On my part, I assure you that I will not return you back to war again. Let us all work together to recover the loss decade and put our country back to the path of development in this new decade. 400,000 people died in the civil war after independence. Millions are still displaced. And half the population urgently need aid, despite foreign donations worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Haru Mutasa reports from the capital, Juba. John Cox says his people voting overwhelmingly to secede from Sudan 10 years ago wasn't a mistake. It's what happened to South Sudan afterwards that broke him. The war in 2013, then another round of fighting in 2016, has left him traumatized. It was not only two or thirteen. We are our colleagues, my brother, we are killed. Even during this struggle, My brothers, they were also killed. So when it repeats itself, it was horrible. Things are now relatively calm, unlike previous peace deals that failed. Some people hope the unity government set up last year will hold. It saw former rebel leader Riyak Mashar sworn in as first vice president, along with four other vice presidents. President Salva Kiir and Mashar are once again trying to work together until elections in 2023. Politicians hope this transitional period encourages refugees and internally displaced people to return to their homes. Thousands of people live here and this is just one of many camps across the South Sudan. There's no running water and not enough food. Many families say they don't know how long they're going to be here and going home for several of them is not an option because of insecurity in some parts of the country. Add to that floods, droughts and intercommunal violence. Children born after independence have never known peace. Aid workers say the humanitarian crisis is worsening. These are some of our greatest concerns. Certainly there's a food insecurity crisis in South Sudan. 1.4 million children are going to be malnourished this year, the highest number in years. Key parts of the peace agreement are still to be implemented. These include establishing a unified national army made up of opposition and government forces. Uh, the people of South Sudan are telling their leadership that, look, we are tired of war. Uh, nobody wants war anymore. If there are some few uh, political leaders who think that they will go and mobilize uh, some of our citizens so that they cause a fight because they want to be leaders of this country, I don't think they will get the audience from the public. The new coalition government is trying to rebuild, focusing on various developmental and infrastructure projects. As new buildings go up in some parts of the country, uniting a bitterly divided nation Building trust and making sure it's safe enough for everyone affected by conflict to return home is going to be much more difficult. Haru Mutasa Al Jazeera, Juba. All right, let's bring in our guests in Juba. Jeffrey Duke, security analyst and director of the South Sudan Action Network on Small Arms, a network against armed violence. 
In Nairobi, Niagoa Toot Poor, South Sudan researcher for Human Rights Watch. And also in Juba, James Okuk, conflict management specialist and senior research fellow at the Center for Strategic and Policy Studies. A warm welcome to you all. Niagoa, let me start with you today. There was so much excitement in South Sudan when it became an independent state. How did things so quickly go from that initial mood of euphoria to there being a civil war breaking out, you know, just a couple of years later? We have to understand that South Sudan got handed a good deal and also a bad deal. Uh, at independence, you had a new government uh, that was made of, of uh, various uh, uh, armed groups, uh, militia leaders, and previously uh, uh, political leaders who were also at war with themselves. Um, and at that point, the person that was steering the ship had also passed away, Dr. John Garan. So from the beginning, you had a very shaky political foundation for the country. Um, you also have to understand that the 2010 uh, election that preceded independence had also led to insurgencies uh, where certain individuals who had not won uh, in electoral processes took up weapons against the new government. Um, also, the 2005 peace deal that paved the way for referendum as well as independence um, also did not address certain key issues, including the question around reconciliation. How do you reconcile not only ethnic groups, but also the political leaders uh, who were going to unite into a government? It also did not address the issue around uh, uh, accountability. How do you address the legacy of the war of successive Sudanese governments, as well as the uh, violence and abuses that had been committed by various Southern armed groups against civilians? Um, so given this and that you had an international community that was eager uh, 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 that was eager to put together a government and a state without addressing certain key issues, you know, this very uh, issues around accountability, the building of institutions, uh, uh, concrete institutions that can be able to hold even if the center falls apart. So these are some of the issues that led to, you know, that made it easy for South Sudan to collapse in December 2013. Jeffrey, from your point of view, were expectations, especially on the part of the international community, were they just too high at the get-go? And were there signs that were obvious early on that these deep-seated issues just weren't being properly addressed? I would like to talk uh, more about the expectation of uh, South Sudanese instead of that of international community. And uh, I do not think the expectations uh, of South Sudanese uh, has been unrealistic uh, in that the country uh, has a lot of potential in terms of uh, the resources, uh, both uh, mineral, oil, and, uh, you know, human resources. Uh, to build a viable state. Uh, there is a very, very huge gap. And I can tell, uh, you know, that South Sudanese are disappointed, they're frustrated, and uh, their hopes are held hostage. James, what are some of the biggest challenges that South Sudan faces today? We have uh, three major challenges. Uh, one, of, one of these is the, the leadership challenge. And this has been missing from the very time of the declaration of the independence uh, up to now. Uh, the political leaders in the country have been much into, into power and struggle, and then they believe in military power more than uh, civilian legitimacy. And, and this has put the country into a train of uh, violence, and this violence has affected uh, the development progress in the country up to now. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is the institution. Uh, those leaders failed to build a strong institution uh, that could have uh, managed uh, the public affairs in the country. And because of uh, this weak institution, uh, those leaders have always run the machinery of the government on personal basis and uh, on connection with uh, whoever uh, they would like uh, to deal with uh, rather than uh, uh, building the country or building the nation. Uh, the, third, the third problem that we have uh, is, the, is the human capacity itself. Uh, South, Sudan, South Sudan is blessed with uh, qualified uh, human resources. But then uh, 
how to utilize them and how to put them into the right position in the public offices, uh, it has been a big problem. And uh, usually nepotism, tribalism, and, uh, and even uh, uh, business connection has been the trend of, uh, of appointing uh, a technocrat into the government. And this, this has caused a, a big problem of, uh, of having wrong people uh, in the right offices of the government. So these three, uh, three, three challenges actually have been faced in South Sudan and they have contributed uh, to the level of the violence that we have now because the civil service is not respected uh, by those uh, liberators. Uh, they respect military ranks more than the, uh, the, than the technocrats. Niagoa, I want to talk for a moment about the scale of human suffering in South Sudan uh, caused by the humanitarian crises there. Of course, um, you have the World Food Program that has said that South Sudan faces its worst hunger crisis, its most extreme levels of food insecurity since independence, that around 60 percent of the population are enduring severe shortages. Then you have UNICEF. They have warned that a record 4.5 million children in South Sudan, that's two out of three children in the country, are in desperate need of humanitarian support. What needs to happen in order to start getting much-needed aid to people who are suffering so much? Yeah, first of all, all those figures that you pointed to are quite depressing um, because like both James and Jeffrey have said, um, this country started with so much promise only to fall by the way white side. Um, and so what has followed the hunger crisis that uh, and likely famine that the country is facing now is mostly a result uh, of this man-made crisis. Uh, it is the result of years of conflict, uh, uh, years of forcing civilians to flee their homes because of violence or the threat of violence. Uh, and is also the result of over the last two years, an escalation of what we have seen uh, of localized violence into communal violence that is egged on by political and military actors in jungle lakes, uh, parts of uh, uh, Northern Barbizal state, and also in Wara. Uh, and so populations in this parts of the country have faced acute uh, malnutrition and acute hunger. Um, and so it, there's also the climate crisis, you know, uh, that has been flooding over the last couple of years. And all this have contributed to disenfranchising South Sudanese. But, you know, the government has over the last couple of years been unable to invest in infrastructure, in, in infrastructure. You know, when you go across the country, even a bird's eye view, you'll see that there's very limited public road networks. Um, the education sector is plagued by lack of capacity uh, uh, and uh, inadequate access to education for several children around the country. Uh, much, of, um, much of service provision, um, much of you know, food security and other critical issues like healthcare is left in the hands of humanitarian agencies. And so South Sudan needs to break away from this cycle of aid and humanitarian uh, dependency. Um, and that can be done by you know, funneling all the oil wealth and resources uh, that the country has into ensuring this basic services are made available to ordinary citizens. But also, uh, even before, uh, while that is being worked on, the government has to ensure an end to obstruction of uh, humanitarian uh, aid uh, and an end to attacks against aid workers and taking action on individuals that attack aid, uh, aid operations. Um, so, you no. Know, so far, um, over a hundred, uh, over 120 uh, South Sudanese, over 120 aid workers have been killed uh, since uh, the conflict started in 2013. And most of these people are South Sudanese, uh, South Sudanese who are sacrificing their lives to go to the front lines to actually to actually be able uh, to support and help their fellow citizens. Um, so a lot needs to happen, but first it's about silencing the guns, uh, the government ensuring that the war in the equatorial comes to an end and that both the opposition, National Salvation Front and the government and the attacks against uh, uh, civilians um, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in uh, the southern part of the country, mm -hmm. but also in Jongle, Warab, and other places, mm. uh, the government needs to take uh, co concrete action uh, on political and military actors who are actually fueling uh, uh, the local violence in these areas. 
Jeffrey Niagoa there uh, was talking at one point about the need to try to funnel oil wealth, you know, to the people to make sure that these humanitarian crises are dealt with. Of course, we know the South Sudan relies on crude sales for revenue, that it's currently experiencing a rapid decline in oil output. For a country that is so rich in oil, why are the people of South Sudan still not really seeing the benefit of that? Well, I think that is mainly because uh, of the a mismatch between uh, the resources and needs of the citizens. Uh, the government uh, can see, can hear the priorities of citizens. Uh, they're obviously uh, all out there, but they have chosen not to, uh, you know, uh, allocate the needed resources uh, to the needs of citizens. Uh, for example, like Nyagoa said, that the health sector uh, is, is largely left for the NGOs to, to, you know, to fund. And that is uh, similar to the education sector. And you see enormous budget allocations to the security sector, yet you cannot see that huge allocation translating into the security and safety of uh, uh, citizens. That, that, that clearly uh, tells us that the value for money uh, uh, doesn't make sense uh, uh, in, in, in this fashion of uh, expenditure. But also related to that, the uh, exploration of resources has largely been done in the shadows. Like there's no clear transparency to track uh, how much uh, South Sudan is actually earning in, uh, uh, from uh, the sale of uh, its resources and uh, where this money is going. Uh, and it, the, the news about corruption is not new. Mm. Um, there's a culture of, of, of impunity resources, uh, uh, you know, coming in from oil uh, and minerals are going into the dark, uh, disappearing uh, into the pockets of individuals. Mm -hmm. Yet there is uh, nothing, nothing being done, you know, to stop such a uh, flow of uh, the national resources into individual pockets. Uh, we have the Anti-Corruption anti uh, Commission, uh, which illustrates the, the existence of uh, institutional device to to root out corruption, mm -hmm. but that is not functioning. Uh, so, so one can say that uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission for, uh, largely uh, was uh, created to exist uh, rather than to function. Uh, so unless the government changes its attitude uh, towards uh, letting uh, uh, government officials loot public resources and get away with it, mm -hmm. uh, we will see these enormous resources continue to go to spoil while the people of South Sudan continue to suffer. James, there are observers and analysts who say that foreign donors need to revise their approach to aid uh, and that they need to start holding South Sudanese leaders accountable. How likely is that to happen? Yeah, it, it can happen, uh, but it needs a uh, courage from, uh, from the donors themselves. Uh, these donors have been supporting the government that does not care for service delivery for a long time. Uh, right from the independence of South Sudan in 2011, there has not been accountability in the public institution that have been tasked with the management of finances and resources of the country. And the donors have not taking keen attention on that. Uh, they kept uh, pouring the, uh, money uh, to South Sudan, and also they, they kept sending uh, their own managers to come and, 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 and take care of, uh, of those donors' funds. And, and no much uh, attention has been paid to the government institution, including the budget itself. How, how do they design the budget? Uh, are there plans? On the basis of uh, of which the budgets, the budget lines are, are are designed, and even after the budget has been approved by the parliament, uh, is it followed or it is not followed? And how much is allocated to the service sector? And how much is allocated to the developmental sector, particularly the infrastructure sector? Uh, how much is allocated to the human resource development sector? All these questions have not been asked, and then. Uh, the donors were busy uh, bringing money, uh, but not, not paying keen attention to, to really whether this money add value uh, to uh, enhancing the capacity of, 
of South Sudan uh, to take care of itself and to control its own destiny uh, like the rest of the nation that, uh, that have uh, 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 taken their independence a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So there, there has been that lack of, uh, lack of attention from, from the donors. And whatever they bring to South Sudan, they think that it is still a young country and uh, there is no much uh, to say about it. Let's, let's compromise with those leaders until... Uh, you know, they learn how to do things better. But mm -hmm. 10 years on the line, those leaders have never learned anything. There are no lessons they are learning. They keep repeating, you know, the same uh, attitude of uh, mismanagement of public uh, resources mm -hmm. because they know somebody will come and take care of the population while they do not take care of the population. Their responsibility is being taken by the, by the donors while they, they run away with the public resources. And, mm -hmm. and this is unacceptable. Uh, as far as the responsibility of a government is concerned. The first thing for a government is to make sure that services are delivered to the citizens. That is not happening. It is the, the donors and then the humanitarian NGOs that are doing that, mm -hmm. that part of the work. Take, for example, the Ministry of Health, what we call the Health Food Fund, including the, all the medicine brought to South Sudan, the government does not have any hand in it. It is all donors who are paying. The donors are taking care of our health system. They are taking care of our health personnel. And the government has raised it end up. And, and, and they left it for those donors as if that is a sector for the donors, not the sector for the government. The same for education. They have abundant teachers. They are not paying them good salaries. They are not paying them salaries in time. Mm -hmm. And they expect them to run schools like that. And the donors are being also... Uh, taking care of, uh, of our school. And the government has just abandoned the responsibility uh, for, for, for James, education of services. James, so I'm sorry, I'm, James, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're starting to run out of time. Um, uh, Niagoa, can I ask you to talk a little bit about the kind of toll that the trauma caused by the civil war has taken on civilians in South Sudan. The civil war was extremely brutal. It took a horrific toll. Uh, it was marked by, you know, rapes, killings, child soldier recruitment. What kind of toll has it taken on everybody? And also, where do things stand when it comes to the establishment of accountability mechanisms like perhaps a war crimes court? Right. I mean, I think, you know, when we talk about the civil war in past tense, uh, it may have been ended by the 2018 peace deal, but its repercussions and its consequences are still felt even today. And so all sides to the war, you know, government and allied militias, the op the, all the opposition groups, all of them cannot claim innocence on what has happened to South Sudanese. Um, all sides killed civilians, committed rapes, uh, uh, abducted uh, civilians and also recruited children and used children in their armed forces. Um, so reckoning from the scale of the abuses that have been committed is something that is important so that we don't have to have another conversation about war breaking out because its root causes were not addressed. Um, and so now the government you know, has to ensure accountability for all these gross violations and gross abuses. The peace deal that they have signed calls on them to establish a war crimes court um, in partnership with the African Union, known as the hybrid court. Now, in January, the government uh, uh, agreed to establish the war crimes court and a commission on truth, reconciliation, and healing, as well as a reparations authority. Uh, and now they're yet to follow through along with the African Union to make this court a reality. This court, you know, chapter five of the peace deal is one of those chapters that reflects the will uh, of the South Sudanese people. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the entirety of the peace deal, this, uh, this segment of the peace deal is, is quite important. But even beyond that, the government needs to ensure reliable and credible institutions for justice. The justice sector is one of the sectors that has been under uh, uh, invested and under prioritized uh, in South Sudan. And so along with creating this, ensuring this war crimes court becomes a, a reality, there have to be reforms in the judiciary to ensure its independence, uh, to ensure uh, enough budget to allow it uh, uh, to build its own capacity. All right, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Jeffrey Duke, Niagoa Tutpur, and James Okuk.
And thank you too for watching. You can see this and all of our previous programs again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.